The pathophysiology of fever is as follows. Exogenous pyrogens initiate fever by prompting host cells, or primarily macrophages, to produce and release anginous pyrogens. These pyrogens, like interleukin-1, have multiple biological functions, crucial for the immune response. They are transmitted to the hypothalamic thermoregulatory center, specifically to the organum vasculosum of the lamia terminalis, OVLT, where they induce synthesis of prostaglandins, of which the PG2 is the most significant. These prostaglandins raise the thermostatic set point to initiate the febrile response. The hypothalamic thermoregulatory center accomplishes heat production by inducing shivering and heat conservation through vasoconstriction. At an established degree, fever is regulated even at a temperature of over 41 degrees Celsius. The heat production approximates loss in health at a higher level of the set point. Therefore, the fever does not climb up relentlessly. Additionally, the function of an endogenous pyrogen interleukin-1 is to activate the T lymphocytes to produce various factors, such as interferon, or INF, and interleukin-2, which are vital for immune response. The production of fever simultaneously with lymphocyte activation is the clearest and strongest evidence in favor of the protective role of fever. The induction of fever results in inhibition of bacterial growth, increased bactericidal effects of neutrophils, production of acute phase protein synthesis, and other physiological changes, such as anorexia and somnolence. These changes suggest that fever has an adaptive role in the host's survival during infection. We will cover the differential diagnosis of fever in an ICU patient in the following slide. The table here represents the most common causes, along with other causes of fever in an ICU patient. The sources of fever in an ICU patient may be infectious or non-infectious. The relative frequency of an infectious and non-infectious fever varies according to the population being studied and the specific definition of infection used. The most common infectious etiologies of fever include ventilator-associated pneumonia, intravascular catheter-related infections, surgical site infections, catheter-related urinary tract infections, and bacteremia from the mentioned sources, and others. There are several non-infectious causes of fever in an ICU patient, amid which benign postoperative fever, drugs, transfusion reactions, and possibly venous thromboembolism are the most common. Some other non-infectious causes of fever include a calculus cholecystitis, acute myocardial infarction, adrenal insufficiency, blood product transfusion, fat emboli, gout, heterotopic ossification, intracranial bleeding, malignant hyperthermia, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, pancreatitis, pulmonary infarction, stroke, thyroid storm, transplant rejection, tumor lysis syndrome, and venous thrombosis. To identify the source of fever, physicians should consider a systemic diagnostic approach. The process of distinguishing between these etiologies is discussed next in the diagnostic approaches. The following steps should be taken for a targeted history and examination of the ICU patient. Whenever a patient develops a fever in the ICU, a thorough review of the medical history and a full physical examination should be performed to look for common as well as serious causes of fever. The magnitude of the fever can be helpful in distinguishing some possible underlying etiologies. The fevers between 38.3 degrees Celsius and 38.8 degrees Celsius may be infectious or non-infectious. The differential diagnosis is longest in this range. The fevers between 38.9 degrees Celsius and 41 degrees Celsius can be assumed to be from an infectious source. The fevers, which are more than 41.1 degrees Celsius, usually have a non-infectious source. The next slide focuses on the steps followed for the physical examination of the patients. A complete physical examination should be performed looking for common, along with serious causes of fever. The clinician should evaluate vascular site entry points, look for a phlebitis, look for a hematoma anywhere, Evaluate any new or altered quality of sputum 
or endotracheal secretions. Perform a lung examination to look for the development of new pneumonia. Assess for the presence of devices, in particular intravascular catheters, urinary catheters, or chest and abdominal drains, and question whether diarrhea is present to suggest possible Clostridiotes difficile infection. Perform a detailed chest and abdominal examination looking for tenderness or rigidity to suggest evidence of an abscess of calculus cholecystitis, pancreas, or menesteric ischemia. Heart sounds should be listened to carefully for new murmurs to suggest endocarditis. Examine the mouth, skin, joints, and lower limbs to look for evidence of poor dental hygiene wound infections and cellulitis, lymphadenitis, septic arthritis, or osteomyelitis. Any swelling, erythema, or tenderness would suggest deep venous thrombosis. Assess the medications, total parenteral nutrition, transfusion, and previous microbiologic history. Remove dressings or plaster from all covered wounds and inspect and examine the wounds. The next slide will focus on some initial investigations for the diagnosis.